Good morning. We'll try that one more time. Good morning, everybody. How are you? Hey, I love that weather yesterday. Amen? Yeah. Maybe we should all move south. Yeah, uh, maybe not too far south. They've had it rough, haven't they? Let's remember to keep them in our prayers. Can we do that? I mean, they have really been rocked and rocked, and not only even extending beyond our borders to the Caribbean. Let's keep those folks because, man, they've been just ravaged. Um, but I, I did love yesterday. Yesterday was pretty nice for September 20, whatever it was. Uh, and it's a good day to be in God's uh, place here with his people just singing and worshiping. And uh, thanks for letting me come today, too. I, I, <laughs> I love worshiping with you all very, very much. And it was a good morning this morning. Amen. So we today are going to be continuing in our series on the vineyard, life in the vineyard. And I just want to real quickly, to special thanks to Pastor Thomas. I don't know if he is in here. There you are. You're sitting in your normal seat. That's good. Assigned seats. And so, Thomas, thank you. Uh, good message. You know, you got to preach, and we talked a little bit about this, but he got to preach my favorite verse in the Bible. If I have one, if I have a life-focused verse, it's John 15 5 and uh, Thomas beautiful message last week. Thank you. We've been talking about connection right abiding and one of the reasons Jesus told us over and over and over again to abide to abide is because we have a tendency as human beings and this doesn't make us bad. It just makes us human. We have a tendency to wander sometimes don't we we just we just kind of wander in our mind or because life just gets to be life and so we wander from that place of intimacy and abiding and connection to Jesus. And so anyway, thank you, uh, Thomas, very much. And the prayer time last Sunday, too, I want to thank everybody. That was, a, that was a beautiful time of prayer, and I don't know um, how much of it you had an opportunity to experience, but boy, that was just wonderful to gather and pray. And let me encourage you, um, keep doing that, okay? Keep praying, passionately seeking the Lord um, through this next season of your life in the ministry um, here at Bayside. Let's continue to just seek the Lord, and prayer is such a key component. So last Sunday was just a blessing, and it was a blessing for me personally. I, I felt like, I, I don't know if you ever felt like this, you're emotionally exhausted and you're spiritually filled. <laughs> you ever been there? Where like, like you're just so emotional, you know, I'm so emotional, I'm just tired emotionally, but yet your cup is full. And, and I left last Sunday. So thank you. Thank you all for a part of being a part of that prayer time. Um, so a couple of things real quick. Number one, the simulcast. We were supposed to have a, a prepared to answer simulcast this coming uh, Saturday. That has been postponed. It says canceled. It's just been postponed. We'll give you more details on that in the future. But don't come here on Saturday at 8 a.m. or you'll just be prayer walking the building. Okay? Just, you'll just be seeking the Lord individually. And um, that will that will be happening. The other thing, just very quickly, this Thursday I have, I believe, my fourth debate with my atheist friend, uh, Dave, and we will be debating a very hot topic in our culture, and that is human sexuality. And so we are going to be um, looking at that and, and interacting around that, and that is this coming Thursday uh, at 7 p.m. at the Encounter in Duluth. And so if you're interested in that, of course, you're welcome to come. But if, if, if you would, if you just believe, please pray. Um, th this, is a, this is a big topic in our culture, right? I mean, this is kind of one of the big hot buttons right now. And so if you'd pray uh, on that day, that would be wonderful. Um, so, okay, so we are talking life in the vineyard, right? And we have been working through John 15. And I've encouraged you to memorize John 15. And I, I just want to do something right now because... Pastor Thomas, you know, you kind of asked people, and I think maybe they're a little more honest with you than they are with me. Um, I, I don't know. Okay, so I'm not going to ask any questions, but, but, but it brought something into my mind. Like, maybe you've struggled memorizing this, or maybe you haven't even struggled yet memorizing this, but I want to do two things. Number one, if you haven't started memorizing, and you think now you were all the way into verse 6, I want to draw this sort of a line in the sand after verse 5, okay? And it's a line that you can cross over. If you've been actively engaged in memorizing, then keep going, okay? But if you haven't, just make a goal for yourselves of getting verses 1 through 5, okay? Just take verses 1 through 5 and maybe set a new goal to say, I'm going to do those, 
I'm not going to worry how far everybody else may be down that road of memorization. But if we get verses 1 through 5, so much of the heart of life in the vineyard is in verses 1 through 5. So let me encourage you, if you haven't started yet, um, just make maybe a new goal of getting 1 through 5 done, okay? And now if you have gotten 1 through 5 and you've been memorizing and keeping on going, then keep going. Keep doing a verse at a time and we're going to set our goal maybe a little further down. But if you haven't, Okay, don't, don't like freak out about that, but let's set a new goal of one through five, all right? Um, and, and so that we can all be immersing ourselves. The beauty of this is immersing ourselves in God's word. It works its way into our head, and then that beautiful passage from Proverbs, then it's hidden in our heart. And when God's word is hidden in our heart, it helps us in the battle against sin, right? Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against sin you. And, and so we want to get that word into our head, and then it kind of immerses into our heart and who we are. So, all right, one through five. We're actually, I'm not going to have you memorize. We can do that next week if, if we want to, but let's just put verses, and, and I'm just going to read this, um, because today is verse six, but verse six, again, we talked about the connection between verse six and verse two, and so I'm just going to read this for you today. Again, I'm going to keep encouraging you in your memorization, but Jesus says this in this beautiful passage, I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. Now, verse 2, sometimes we've connected verse 2 and verse 6, but they're so different because verse 2 says, Every branch in me, this is a connected branch that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And we said that word takes away would be better defined as he what? Lifts up. Remember that? He lifts up. If you're a branch that has not been bearing fruit, but you are in Christ, it's probably because something has beaten you down or, or you've let yourself wallow a little bit. And so if you're a, if you're a connected but a not fruit-bearing branch, he's going to lift you so that you can bear fruit. So every branch that in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away or he lifts it up. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Verse 3 is a beautiful gospel message, right? Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. We are not clean because of anything that we have ever done. Amen? We are only clean because of Jesus and who Jesus is, and the Word as it became flesh. The Word that was with God, and the Word that was God, and then became flesh and dwelt among us. We are only clean because of the Word, and the work of the Word, and that Word is Jesus. So beautiful gospel in verse 3. Then verse 4 and 5, these two beautiful pictures of abiding. And Jesus says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me in me. And then verse 5, my favorite of all verses. I am the vine, Jesus says, and you are the branches. Intimacy, connection, relationship, oneness with God through Jesus. Awesome. This is awesome. It doesn't get better than this, my friends. Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit a life of fruit, a life of significance, a life of purpose, a life that will last when, when, when all things end. This will be a life that will have significance for eternity in the kingdom. Does it get better than abiding? I don't think so. I don't think it gets any better than verses 4 and 5. He it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. That puts me in a beautiful place of connection, and intimacy, and dependence, and love, and relationship, and oneness. And Jesus says, come on, just abide with me. Just connect with me. Just remain right here, because I love you so much. And you're so beautiful, and I created you with such perfect beauty. Now just stay right here. Okay, we could just go home. <laughs> Not yet. You know, as beautiful as verses 1 through 5 are and as wonderful, it takes a really hard turn in verse 6. And I want to pray before we take that hard turn because I don't want us to forget how beautiful and how true and how real for a branch that is in Christ, how incredible a life of relationship and peace with God and fruit is as we work into the most difficult passage in this in verse in this entire passage. So I want to pray for us, okay? I want to pray that God's Holy Spirit will be with us, that he will move in our hearts. Some of us 
need to hear this message today. Um, maybe all of us need to hear this, some of us more than others. This is a serious day. This is a serious verse. This is a hard teaching, but it's a reality of the vineyard. So we can't talk about the vineyard in its full, the vineyard being God's vineyard from all of time. We can't talk about that without getting into verse 6. So I want to pray for us that the Lord would just move and work and have his way in our hearts, okay? So will you pray with me as we get started? Father, we come to you now, and again, we are so grateful. Jesus, you have made us clean. We are clean not because of anything that we have ever done. We know our works outside of you, Jesus, are pretty useless. They're useless. And so, Father, we could not earn or be born into or work our way to relationship or cleanliness from a spiritual perspective. We all had an issue, a problem, a dirt problem. And Jesus, you came and you washed us and you cleansed us. And it was by your beautiful cleansing blood, Jesus, that you saved us and you made us clean. And we take no credit in that. We boast in nothing but the cross. Nothing but the cross of you, Jesus, is where our boast lies. We were incapable, completely, utterly helpless and hopeless to do anything for ourselves. But Jesus, you saved us. You reconciled us. You connected us into this vineyard and this true vine. And we just want to say thank you. Christ, thank you. Holy Spirit, thank you for regenerating us, bringing us back to life. God, thank you for loving us enough to do that. Jesus, I just want to say I just want to praise you and I want to thank you, God, that today you have a plan for each of us. You have a plan, and Father, I would pray that your Holy Spirit would reveal that to each of us. God, as we look into this difficult verse in this passage, I pray that, God, you would communicate what you desire to today. That again, this would not be my ideas or my words, but that this would be straight from you, God, to our hearts. Father, help us to understand the seriousness, God, of this, of this reality in the vineyard. So God, will you be with us? I surrender, I commit all of this to you now, God, for your glory and your kingdom and your fruit bearing today. So we thank you and we worship you and we love you and we pray all this now in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. amen. Verse six, in my mind, the most difficult verse in this passage. I was not looking forward to this verse at any point in this series. Verse 6 from John 15. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. The life comes more and more out of a disconnected branch, a withering. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. Now I want to tell you for a moment that word abide again is in the aorist tense, which means it's not regarding time. So this could be said like this, any branch that has never abided, that is not abiding, or ever will abide. That, that, that is how we could phrase that, that this is a branch that has never, is not, and will not abide in the vine. So this is an unsaved, non-Christian, unbelieving, spiritually dead branch. This is the worst case scenario for any branch in the vineyard. There is no worse case than this. It's awful. You know, God used fire often in Scripture. Fire was an analogy that he used. He used it in a very negative sense, often in verses like this and in, in terms of the end of all things. But he also used fire in a positive sense that our faith is even refined by fire. So we are tested by fire. And so he uses fire in both a believer's and an unbeliever's life. And sometimes even a believer's life feels hot, like we are going through the fire of our faith being refined. And we can relate to that. So fire is used both. It's an important thing in Scripture. I've spoken of hell, and this is really a passage about hell. That's what the end of this passage is. And I've spoken about hell in the past. It's the worst topic I'll ever preach on. There's no worse 
There's no worse topic that any preacher could ever preach on. I've heard this and I believe this. If you can speak on hell casually, then you don't understand hell. If you can speak on hell flippantly, then you don't understand it. And I believe that. I don't believe any of us understand everything there is to understand about hell. Like heaven, we have multiple glimpses of what it would be like. But anyone who says definitively hell will be this, I'm suspect of that. Because I believe God intentionally doesn't give us everything there is to know about hell. Saying that, I do believe in a literal hell. I do. I believe it will be the worst possible existence imaginable. I believe the worst part of it is it will be void from the presence of the Father. It will be void from the presence of the Father. God will not be there. And I believe that will be the worst part of hell. I believe fear of hell is not the best motivation to receive or grow in Christ. So I don't believe hell should dominate our preaching. And if you've been here for any amount of time, you know that it doesn't dominate. It's not the main thing we talk about. Yet I believe we also can't completely avoid the topic. I believe we can't completely avoid it because God doesn't and Jesus didn't. What will hell be like? It's an important, it's a debated question, it's partially unknown. Some believe hell will be an eternal, never-ending, conscious suffering of torture. And there's verses and passages that would make you think that. Some believe hell may be a period of suffering followed by a divine annihilation. And there's verses and passages that can make you believe that. Both can be fit into both of the justice of God and at the same time the mercy of God. And theologians have debated, is hell forever conscious suffering or is there a period of suffering followed by a consummation like a branch that gets consumed? I want to read a couple of passages related to hell. Psalm 21, 8 and 9. Your hand will find out all your enemies. Your right hand will find out those who hate you. You will make them as a blazing oven when you appear. The Lord will swallow them up in his wrath and fire will consume them. You know, maybe God's final act to unbelievers is a merciful one in consuming them. I don't know that. We know that his justice needs serving, and it was served in Christ. But we also believe that for those who don't receive Christ, they reject that gift of eternal life. We also know that God is gracious to the core, isn't he? He's gracious to the core. Second Thessalonians 1, starting in verse 5, this is evidence of the righteous judgment of God. Our God is as just as he is gracious, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering currently. Since indeed God considers it just to replay, repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel, the good news of our Lord Jesus who haven't received the gift. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. Here's the worst of it. Away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When he comes on that day to be glorified with his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. Hell is real, I believe. Hell is real. It's awful. It's the worst case scenario for any branch in the vineyard. 
We should be thankful, those of us who have been connected. We should be so, so thankful to avoid hell. Amen? Thankful to avoid hell. You know, you, we have an expression, hell on earth. Have you heard that expression? I'm living hell on earth. And people, I think inherently, believers and non, use that expression because somewhere deep inside of us, we, eternity resides in our hearts. And so we know somewhere that this is a reality. We don't like to think about it and we don't want to focus on it. But I think hell on earth speaks to the fact that every person knows there is something else other than eternal bliss with God. We kind of know that. You know, the worst hell on earth that I ever experienced happened about five years ago. And we were doing a series on Wednesday nights here about the parables, the parables of Jesus. And one of the parables is the strong man, the parable of the strong man. And that parable moves into a teaching on something called the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever heard of that? The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? It's in Mark 3 and, and it's in Luke and Matthew 12. And Pastor Thomas and I would often talk about these parables before we would teach them. And the, I, I want to read just a portion of this in case you're unfamiliar with this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And I had studied this teaching prior to us going through this together on, on preparing for this Wednesday night. But I want to read Mark 3, verses 28 to 29. The, the parable happens before this, but this is the teaching on what is called the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. Now, now some have taken that, and I think I did in my younger days before I really had studied this, and they, they've, they've been fearful of what if I commit this sin, this mysterious sin that doesn't have forgiveness to it? What if I, what if I commit this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and then I sort of condemn myself to hell by committing this sin? And I've had people be really scared of that, of committing that sin. Do you, do you guys know what I'm talking about? Have you? Okay. And so I studied this before even this time when Pastor Thomas and I were going to be teaching on this. And, and I knew that, and if you look at this passage closely, you can see that all sins will be forgiven and whatever blasphemies they utter. So, so this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is not a sin that we can do in a, in a moment and it's not something that we can speak. Because you see, he says, all of those will be forgiven. But then he says, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness. Now what that is, that is, you know, the Holy Spirit's job, according to John 16, in the life of an unbeliever is to convict them of sin so that they will be pointed to Jesus. Okay, so the Holy Spirit in an unbeliever's life is trying to convince them that they are a sinner in need of a Savior. And so an unbeliever who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, that word blaspheme means to rail against or to speak evil against, to vilify. So in an, when, when the Holy Spirit is speaking into an unbeliever's life, you are a sinner in need of a Savior, this blasphemy, which again is in an aorist tense, which means it's not related to time, so they will time after time after time after time when the Holy Spirit speaks to an unbeliever and says, you are a sinner in need of a Savior, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is a constant rejection of that message saying, no, I am not a sinner, I don't need a Savior. That is the blasphemy, and if they do that forever, then they will never have salvation. That's what the blasphemy is. Does that make sense? Did I explain that okay? So this fear of a Christian to commit this is not what this passage in any way is teaching. This is not even being taught to a believer, this, this passage or this teaching. It's being taught to an unbeliever who consistently rails against, blasphemes, tells the Holy Spirit, you're a liar. I'm not that bad of a person. 
I'm not a sinner in need of a savior. I'm not as bad as this guy. Look at some of the that that's the ra- that's the lying, the railing. And that's what the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. And so when Pastor Thomas and I were talking and we were talking in what was the old library, it's this corner office. And we were discussing this and and I was saying I know it's not about speaking any words, and I'm going to be honest with you for a minute. I was speaking, we were rushed for time, and I was speaking callously, and I was speaking casually of this passage and of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. I was speaking in a way that I shouldn't, and I just very casually said, yeah, I could say anything against the Holy Spirit and that wouldn't condemn me to hell. I could speak any mistruth against that and that wouldn't. And, and, and I spoke what happened earlier in that passage. And I spoke it in a way that was very casual and it was very calloused. And as Thomas and I are sitting there, and I've never experienced this before in my life, a wave of dread came over me. And it was a dread like I have never felt in my life. And a voice came into my head and it would not leave that said, you just committed that, Mark. You just committed that. You've just condemned yourself to hell. And I have never felt a dread I've never felt a dread like that in my life. And I felt it deep in my core. I knew in my head what I had studied and what I had learned, but this was at a level that was deeper than that. And I told Thomas, I said, Thomas, something has happened to me and I don't know what it is. But I got to get out of this room. And I walked out of the room and I came right in that door and I walked right down here. I didn't know where else to go. And I kneeled right here and I said, God, oh, I hope this isn't true. I hope this isn't true. But I am so sorry. And I hope this isn't true. But I couldn't get rid of the dread. And I couldn't get rid of the emptiness. And I'm going to be honest with you. I thought if this continues what I'm experiencing in these, in these moments, it would be better for me to walk out to that road and just stand in front of the next bus that comes by. Because that dread, that pain, that emptiness, that fear was like nothing I had ever felt in my life. It was hell on earth. And I'd never experienced anything like that. And for the next week, I went back and forth. And my brain was telling me, Mark, you didn't. You know doctrinally. You know theologically this doesn't say that. But you couldn't convince something deep in here that I hadn't. And a week to the day later, I was praying, and I was seeking the Lord. And I was thinking, if this is any reality of hell, God, don't let me ever think of hell the same way again. Don't let me ever speak casually of it. Rescue as many people as you possibly can from that. Because if that is what hell is, if that dread is what it means to be void from the presence of God, then God help me to rescue and save as many people. But I couldn't get rid of the pit here. And I was taking a walk on the boardwalk. And I was praying and I was asking the Lord, God, I don't know if I can live like this. And a passage came into my mind and it was the passage related to the grieving of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever heard of the grieving of the Holy Spirit? And it is something that we can do. We can grieve him. The Holy Spirit can feel grief based on our words. And if you look into that passage of grieving, it's related to the words that we speak. And we can grieve his spirit by words that are not pleasing to him. And I started thinking, I'm like, oh my. I didn't blaspheme the Holy Spirit, but I grieved him worse than I ever grieved him. You see, I spoke in a casual way about about what must be the most hurtful thing to the Holy Spirit of God. 
You see, those that reject the Holy Spirit's message, those that blaspheme him for their entire lives has to be the thing that causes more grief in the Holy Spirit's heart than anything else. I can imagine what would hurt him more. And I took his greatest pain and I spoke of it casually and I spoke of it callously and I got this picture that in my callousness to just teach right doctrine, I just took and I just, I just... I just, I just slapped the Holy Spirit. It was that, that picture that I got that I just grieved him. And I didn't blaspheme him. And I didn't commit some sin that really can't be committed. But I grieved the one with whom it was about. And I grieved him in a way that broke his heart. And when in my mind, when I slapped him, his face just turned. I didn't become a branch that wasn't connected any longer. But I hurt him. And he could no longer do, whether he chose or could no longer, I don't know, but he could no longer do what he, one of the things he, was, he does in our lives. And then the passage came in that the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are his children. You see, it is the Spirit's job to convince me and tell me, no, you're mine. And I had never understood that verse like that in my life. What a gift it is when the Holy Spirit of God tells us over and over and pushes into us, you are my child, Mark. You are mine. You are saved. And there is nothing that you can ever do to, take, to be taken from my hand. Nothing. But when I grieved him, when I hurt him, through callous words ultimately about hell and about eternity, It limited my ability to hear that voice of the Spirit of God saying in my heart, you're mine. You're mine. I repented. I repented and I said, Holy Spirit of God, I am so sorry. I can't imagine how speaking of hell in such a calloused way must have felt for you. The guy who's supposed to be sharing your love And just spoke of it so casually. And I repented. And joy entered my heart. And dread went away. And I have never floated down the boardwalk like I floated that day. Hell is real. The dread is real. We don't have to fear it. We don't have to fear it. But because we believe in it, we tell others. Because we believe in it, we share. So what does life in the vineyard look like to a disconnected branch? I want you, if you will, for a moment to imagine with me. Imagine a huge, beautiful vineyard. Have you ever watched the Narnia movies? (laughs) Imagine a Narnian vineyard with one huge vine in the middle, a tremendous sprawling vine that goes over the whole vineyard and millions of branches connected to this vine. It's a timeless vineyard. And millions of branches connected, bearing fruit, And this vine that is just filled with life and green and lush and larger than any vine that you've ever seen in your life and it sprawls over the whole existence of Narnia. (laughs) And then imagine a branch that is sitting and it's withering and it's not connected to that vine. And the vine dresser, the garden, comes up and it's speaking to this branch and it's saying, look at it. Look at what I've created for you. You, you, This didn't all just come. And there's other branches that are disconnected and it's talking to those branches and 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 the gardener is saying, I have life for you. I have a life of purpose and fruit and eternal life for you and look at all that I gave you because I love you. 
I love you, the gardener is saying. And then a breeze comes in. And the Spirit of God blows on those branches and it's saying, you know you're broken. You know you need to be rescued. You know you're not living life to the full. You know that in this this breath of wind comes in and is speaking the need to be connected to this vine, this massive life-giving vine, and this, this, this wind is breathing and speaking and saying, you need it, you need to be rescued. And then the branches that are attached to this vine are crying out. They're saying, listen, we were like you one day. Well, one, at one point, we were, we were dead too. We were without life. And, and these branches are begging. These connected, fruitful branches are literally begging. These branches, please be connected to this true vine. Please. There's life here. There's hope here. We were there. We get it. We're not better than you. We did nothing to get ourselves here. But there's life here. And it's crying out to these branches that are withering away. And then the true vine, this massive life-giving vine, is holding his arms and he's saying, look at what I did for you. You know, in a real tree for an unnatural branch to be grafted in, it must be cut, right? That branch must be cut. That life-giving vine must be cut in order for that branch to to graft in and experience life. And this true branch is saying, look at I was cut for you. Look at what I did for you. Look at, look at, look at the holes in my hands and in my side. And like Jesus said, put your hand in there. Find life in my scars. Find life in me. He's saying, please, please. I was cut for you. I was broken for you. I died for you. And so the gardener is saying, look at what I created out of my love for you. And the Holy Spirit is saying, you know you're broken. Please, you need a rescue. And the other branches are saying, we were dead like you, but we're not now. And the true vine is pulling out his hands and he's saying, I was broken and cut for you. Find life in me. And everything in this vineyard is screaming out to these branches because the reality is outside of that connection with that vine, those branches have no hope. They have no hope. They will wither to death. They will wither to death. (laughs) Governor and Senator Harold Hughes was asked the advantage of being a Christian, and he said, as a Christian, this life is all of hell that I will ever experience. But the disadvantage to being a non-Christian is this life is all the heaven that some will ever know. If what I'm speaking today is true, if what I am speaking today is true, then there are only two reasonable, rational responses for every one of us in this room. There's only two reasonable, rational responses if what I'm saying is true. If you are a branch that is connected to the true vine, then go and preach and beg and live and implore every single person that is not connected to be reconciled to God through Jesus. Go live the gospel with more passion and fervor and commitment than you or I have ever lived. 
if this is true and hell is real, then there is nothing that can be apathetic or indifferent. There is no greater priority. There is nothing in all of the existence of this vineyard that is more important than branches calling out to dead branches. You need Jesus. Please. I was dead too. But now I have been given life. And so I beg of you, be reconciled to God. The true vine was broken for you. And if you and I have been connected, then nothing else in life matters much other than the message to those dead branches if what I'm saying is true. The second rational, reasonable response if you are one of those dead branches today and there is no spiritual life in you then let me please encourage you to trust in Jesus today. Not out of fear of hell, but out of the love of the Father as displayed in Jesus. Because he wants relationship with you so desperately. He loved you with such a fervent love that he sent his son to die. And so if you know you don't have spiritual life flowing in you through the confirming, life-giving sap of the Holy Spirit of God, if you don't have that, then today, let today be the day where you, you turn from everything that was your life. You turn to Jesus. You look unto him. You trust, you believe that when he died on the cross, when he was broken, when he gave his life, that that blood that, that poured out, spilled out from Jesus, can cleanse you from all sin. And then you receive that greatest of all gifts. If this is true, and hell is real, then those are the only two rational responses. Either we live with a fervor and a passion of the gospel flowing into us and we rescue as many dead branches as we can by the power of God and the regeneration power of the Holy Spirit. Or if you have not trusted and you don't know, if you don't know that you are saved, well, let me encourage you with 1 John chapter 5. These things, God's word, Christ coming to life. These things have been written that you may know that you have eternal life. So if you don't know in this moment, you can know in the next. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If you don't know in this moment where you would spend eternity, you can know in the next moment. Because that same Bible that preaches and teaches all of this guarantees you these things have been written. God's word has been revealed. God's heart in the vineyard has been spoken to you so that you may know. We're going to pray. And I'm going to pray for both of those two responses. And I'm praying everyone in this room will respond in one of those two ways. You will either respond to say, I am going to live, if this is true, I am going to live with a fervor and a passion and a commitment starting today and recommitted tomorrow and recommitted again on Tuesday and then on Wednesday. You get the picture. I'm going to live with a recommitment of the gospel, the Holy Spirit's life and power lived through me to rescue dead branches. And I'm going to ask you to commit to that today if you are a branch that is connected. There's no room for apathy. There's no room for indifference. There's no room in the vineyard for anything but a life wholly devoted to the true vine because that love was far too costly. And then I'm going to pray for those of you if you don't know. And if you don't know, please, I'll say in the words of Apostle Paul himself, I implore you, I beg you, be reconciled to God. 
You don't have to work for it. You can't earn it. All you can do is turn to Jesus, looking unto him, believe that when he died, he did that for you and put your faith in that and receive the ultimate gift, the gift of eternal life. Because this vineyard is not a temporary one. This is an eternal vineyard. And when we are connected, we are connected for eternity. So I'm going to pray. And I'm going to pray first for those of you, if you have not received that gift, I'm going to ask you, you don't have to do this, but would you please bow your heads and close your eyes? And when I pray, and if you know today you need Jesus because you're a disconnected branch. You know there's no spiritual life inside of you and the Holy Spirit is convincing you even in these moments, he's speaking truth. And you need that. You need that. If that is you today, then as I am praying, I'm just gonna ask you to look up at me. I'm just gonna ask you to make eye contact with me. And that is gonna be your way of saying, today is the day of my salvation. Today is the day that I am going to receive, perhaps for the first time, the gift of eternal life. I may have been religious up to this point. I may have been a churchgoer up to this point. I may have done some good things up to this point. But only the Word becoming flesh, dwelling among us, and giving His life for you and me is what will save me today. And if that is where you are at, then I just want you to make eye contact with me. And I'm going to look around, and that is going to be your statement of faith saying, Jesus, I trust you. I trust you for eternal life and nothing else. So we're going to pray. Again, yes, you. Yes, you. And I'm going to ask you again to close your eyes, if you would, and bow your heads. And as I pray for you, just give me a look. And it, trust me, it has nothing to do with me, but it's just your way of responding to the Lord. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. We worship you. We adore you. We give you all praise and glory for the gospel, for the good news of Jesus. We praise you that you alone save us, that we are clean because of nothing that we have ever done, nothing that we could ever do. Christ, we trust in you today. We put our faith, Jesus Christ, in you alone today. You were broken that we might be grafted in. You were cut. Your side had a spear thrown in that we might find life in your blood, that we might find forgiveness in you and you alone, Christ. And I pray for every one, God, this morning who is looking unto you, Jesus, looking unto you alone for salvation, that you, by your Holy Spirit, would regenerate them to new life today. Holy Spirit of God, bring them spiritually into a new world, that they will walk in newness of life because of what you have done, Christ. I praise you and I thank you for that gift of eternal life. Do a new work today, Jesus. Do a new work in lives and in hearts. We worship you today, God, and we thank you. Father, I also want to pray for those of us who have found connection to you, Jesus. We have found life in your name, but we haven't been living with the passion and the fervor and the commitment as if this is true. And so, God, first and foremost, we are going to honestly just repent. And we are going to confess that, Lord, before you, knowing you know our hearts. You know where we've been. If we've been prone to wander, then, God, we come back. We come back to a place of fervent, passionate commitment, devotion to your gospel, to your kingdom, that we would live like those first early Christians, Father, who knew that the resurrection happened. They witnessed it, and they gave all of their lives for the commitment to that kingdom. And God, that same resurrection has happened in our life. You resurrected us to new life. So, Father, we ask for a forgiveness for being consumed or taken with anything outside of you, Jesus. And so now, today, God, we make a commitment to that. We make a commitment to live the gospel, Jesus. To live and preach the gospel in how we walk, in how we move, in how we talk, in how we spend, in how we invest, in how we love Jesus. We make a new found commitment to that gospel. And so, Father, I pray for all those in here, those beautiful, connected branches. And I pray that you would do a deep and a mighty work in them. Father, we commit all of ourselves to you. 
We commit this time to you. We commit our, this body, this community, this church to you, Jesus, for your glory and for your kingdom sake. Forgive us, God, for anything that is outside of that. We love you, our true vine. We love you, our true vine. We thank you for the life that you have breathed inside of us. We thank you for the new life that has sprung to life today. Father, I pray that you would now continue that work. You, which began the good work inside of us, would continue that, bring that to full fruition for your glory, God, and your glory alone. We love you. We worship you. And it's in the powerful and the all-saving name of Jesus that we pray. Everyone said? Amen. Amen.